Science in Space Nuclear Power and Propulsion. We have some excellent technical experts here in space nuclear power, propulsion, energy, conversion, and policy who will share their vision for upcoming opportunities, challenges, changes, and or trends that they're observing in the field. So we have Steve Johnson here from Idaho National Laboratory, Lee Mason from NASA Glenn Research Center, John Cassani from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Mike Houts from NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, Dan Levak from Aerojet Rocketdyne, and Bavia Law. Um, it, it's, what is your organization again? The Science and Technology Policy Institute, STIPI. So the format for our panel today will be 10 minute presentations. And um, so these 10 minute presentations, we're not gonna have any Q&A. Uh, our speakers will share their vision and um, enjoy the presentations. So please take it away. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Stephen Johnson, Idaho National Laboratory. Um, I have just a few thoughts. I didn't prepare any slides, but uh, most of you know that the INL is involved uh, in fueling, testing, delivering uh, radioisotope power system units. Uh, that's something that we've done, that or something very close to it, uh, at a number of different sites around the U.S. over the last decade and a half. Uh, we've uh, done that at Hanford, KNNL, uh, Savannah River site. We've gone to Russia to support plutonium-238 uh, procurements, as well as where they uh, docked uh, at the U.S. Naval Port uh, when the Russian freighter brought the material over here. Uh, that's given us a, a, a kind of the tail of the dog sort of perspective. We're typically the people that are uh, the last on the schedule, uh, the people that uh, get whatever margin is left to them in order to uh, make operations happen. That, that uh, probably gives us a reputation of being a little bit on the crusty side when it comes to schedules and optimism, that sort of thing. It's, uh, it's not that we're not, that we don't want to be optimistic people. It's just uh, we typically are the ones that everybody else eats our margin and our schedule. So it tends to uh, rest with us a little bit more than it does with, with other folks. But I had three small points I wanted to make here, and, and I, I won't consume my 10-minute allocation. I'll pass it on to my colleagues. And uh, one thing that I, I felt was a good point um, we, sh we should make, I, I'd really like us to look forward to having an RPS, a radioisotope power system arsenal that has more than one model on the shelf. Uh, the, the history ha has been over the last several decades that pretty much they kill off the last model throw away the plans, burn them, uh, distribute the, the parts as, uh, you know, uh, paperweights on desks and move on to the next model. And that's been the case going back through, uh, you know, whether you're looking at a SNAP-17, a 19, a 27, uh, the MHWs, the GPHS RTGs, uh, and now the MMRTGs. And we need to get to that point where we have more than one model on the shelf and can actually support it. Uh, we seem to be moving towards a a realm right now where we're going to have a unit for uh, that can work in space and on the uh, on the terrestrial uh, environment, uh, planetary environment, which is uh, an MMRTG or whatever may succeed that. And we're moving towards having a unit that is specific to deep space operations. And currently, the thought is the uh, next gen RTG that is uh, a developmental effort uh, led by the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, I think that's really important that we don't have, uh, we don't kill off the, the last one be, and uh, have just a single unit. I think it's important that we, we get to that point where we can support more than one uh, product line, if you will. Um, let's see, Lee may actually be uh, shocked to hear my next words, but um, I, I think with, uh, you know, I really feel going down the line that uh, if we set realistic goals, schedules, and cost estimates, that's going to lead to an application of some sort of reactor technology in the coming years. But I, I think it's really important that we do keep all those those goals, those schedules, those cost estimates in, in line, and that they're they're fairly well sourced, and we have a consensus buy-in. 
Uh, but the reactor technology is going to be the only thing that's going to get us, whether it's to uh, using nuclear thermal propulsion, get us to Mars, or to support whether it's a lunar base or a Martian base down the line. We, we're, we're not going to get any other technology to pr provide that, uh, that power. But we do need to make certain that we, we keep ourselves halfway honest and make certain that we do um, draw out reasonable schedules, that nothing will turn off our, our funding agencies more than, than not doing that. So, but I do think that's, that's in the cards and it's something that is uh, going to happen. Um, last is kind of a point that rolls the first two together. I, I think uh, having looked at, um, I'll go back in history to probably 2001, and let's see, I looked up the right name for it as opposed to the name we all use. The, the, looking at the RPS provisioning strategy report, which was, it came out in May of 2001. And that went through a number of different technologies, some that were uh, still being developed, some that were, I would say, uh, were on their last legs and, and made some recommendations that were implemented uh, in the next two or three years after that. But part of that was uh, also involved in that was uh, sunsetting uh, one of the uh, successful generators of that time, which was the GPHS RTG. And I think we, we need to be careful about it, that sort of, uh, not that that was the report's uh, intent, but be careful about the, the predatory practice of killing the last one before you get the next one going or keeping a couple of them going at the same time. I think that's very important and so that we've got the right units on the shelf and uh, to support the NASA driven mission. That's all I've got. <clears throat> wow, those were some great points, Steve, thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna switch directions just a bit as you might expect. Uh, oh, oh, all right, hardware change. So um, I have been attending this conference and its predecessors since 1987 when I got my first job at NASA. And it's obviously come a long way. There's been a lot of highs and lows. I've seen a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. When I first started coming to the conference, it was SP100 and Topaz. And we went through this big period where we were doing lunar surface uh, power systems and Mars power systems, really big nuclear electric propulsion uh, vehicles. And, and gradually over the years, I, I, my first study was um, to look at a lunar base application for a megawatt power plant. And within a few years of that, we were exploring 500 kilowatt plants. Uh, when Prometheus came along, it got down to 200 kilowatts. And hopefully you guys are seeing a trend here, 200 kilowatts. We didn't quite get through Prometheus. We moved on to affordable fission surface power, 40 kilowatts. Uh, and now the most recent incarnation, kilopower, one to 10 kilowatts. So uh, we're, we're um, obviously heading in a direction towards lower power. And I mean, that may disturb a lot of you folks in the audience who love high power, as I do, but it turns out that we have to be a little bit realistic about our systems matching them with missions. And uh, you know, uh, we've learned that over the years, I think, and that has, has resulted in this gradual trend towards lower power systems. You know, it, it's wonderful to think about landing five megawatts on the moon, but it, you also need to land all the things that will use that five megawatts. And right now, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to think about that uh, just in terms of our capacity to take things from here to there. So that's kind of a precursor. I have a few slides I'm going to run through kind of quick. Uh, everybody knows the history of space nuclear, but this is my slant on it. Uh, we only flew one reactor. Oh. How come that's not? Oh, uh, is my, thank you, Steve. Gosh. Too many <laughs> electronics all happening at once. Now, now you see what I'm talking about. All right, uh, so only one, one reactor, the SNAP-10A, many studies and components, but no systems that, that uh, came from that beyond the one we flew. We spent a lot of time with Rover Nerva, made amazing accomplishments, but those aren't really translatable to power reactors, which I'm more interested in. SP-100 was a big push, lots of interest from lots of agencies, but all those agencies kind of contributed to a very complex set of requirements and uh, I think as a result brought about its demise. Um, Prometheus, my friend here next to me was the program manager of Prometheus, which 
was resurrected, I would say, space reactor technology for a while, but probably tied it to a mission that was a little bit too ambitious. I don't know if John would agree or not, but as it turns out, it did come to a premature end. And then we were told to become affordable, and that was the fission surface power project. So um, yep, I got to remember to do this twice. So uh, hopefully the numbers that you see behind me are familiar to you. It's just kind of a snapshot of those three main power development projects and for reactors. Um, the trend that you, you might notice is look at the thermal power first because we started with two and a half megawatts, then we went to 800 kilowatts with uh, GIMO and 200 kilowatts or so with fission surface power. That's that trend we're down. We also learned uh, about the complexities of high temperature materials. And so where SP100 was developing this very cool uranium nitride fuel and refractory alloy cladding uh, during GIMO, we, we, we looked at that a little more carefully and, and maybe decided that that might, be, might have been a little bit bridge too far. Uh, and ultimately in fission surface power, we went to a pretty low tech stainless steel and u oxide uh, configuration. And all that brings me to this slide. Uh, thanks, Steve, <laughs> you're a good partner. Uh, here is our, uh, you know, this is our history right here, guys. Uh, this is the basis by, I think, which a model that we should be thinking about in terms of deploying space reactors. Uh, Admiral Rickover in 1953 made some famous statements about paper reactors versus real reactors. And you can read his attributes. Uh, there's an excellent book at the bottom that I urge you all to read. But his point was there was a lot of people who were pitching paper reactors. And his objective was to build real ones that would work. And he knew that those would be complicated, large, expensive, heavy, always behind schedule and requires an immense amount of effort on what would seem like trivial details. And I think that is pretty representative of, of the reactor development uh, requirements. So here we are. Uh, I, I put together this chart to show uh, mass versus power for a range of technologies that I've worked Oh, gosh. Good thing you guys are paying attention. Uh, so mass versus. That's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> mass versus power for a number of technologies. A lot of these systems were, were designs that I developed over the years. Um, and so uh, I, I can really kind of talk to almost every one of those uh, markers that are on the plot. And, and there's a trend in surface power systems now looking at this 1 to 10 kilowatt class for the moon and Mars based on kilopower. But we had done uh, designs up to 40 kilowatts. And, in the early days, 500, 800 kilowatts. NEP, I think, is on a slightly different uh, trajectory in terms of the potential to really reduce mass. It has to be, because that's the only way that those missions close, is by really lightweight and, and high temperature reactors. But here's what I would offer there. One more time. This is not a word, I'm sure of it, but uh, it, you know, owing to uh, Admiral Rickover, I think uh, that those, those systems that are to the right are really uh, more uh, paper than real. And so I, I urge us all to focus on the left-hand side, get something done, and, and hopefully use it as a foundation for doing uh, future things. So uh, Steve, thank you. So here we are currently, a few thoughts about uh, where I think we stand. We just completed Krusty, a real space reactor tested with nuclear heat not a paper reactor. Uh, it, it, it brought together a, a really strong team with NASA and the DOE labs at Los Alamos and Y-12. We got a lot of great attention. I think we have a commitment from headquarters that they want to continue to pursue this technology and hopefully fly it soon. Um, there's a lot of interest in the mission community. It, it's a good match for their requirements. It's not developing a five megawatt system for missions that only need uh, 100 kilowatts. Uh, so I, I like the, the connection there, and um, I really think there's a growing potential to fly one of these things soon. And so my last chart is this. Thanks, Steve. Um, we're certainly not done. There's a lot more work to do. Uh, I'm proud of the f what, what has been done with kilopower, but we have a lot to do. We have to find our flight demonstration opportunity. It has to be well matched. We have to expand the team to include industry. I mean, the, the team that did Krusty was a very small team, and it needs to be 
uh, bolstered to, to do a flight system development. I think we need to be careful to prevent the mission from imposing performance requirements beyond the capability of the technology that exists. Uh, that's been a, a burden in past uh, developments. Uh, we need to uh, stay on our cost and schedule plans. Uh, and HEU, you, you heard the congressman the other day about his concerns about that, and there are others besides him that we'll have to consider. Uh, so we have to establish reasonable practices for working with it and negotiate the complex launch uh, you know, approval process that we've heard a lot about. Uh, but the key, I think, if we're going to be successful, to continue to deliver on promises like we did on Krusty, that's the only way we're going to get forward with uh, space reactors. So that's my, my comments. I'll turn it over to my friend John. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. So, uh, yes, my perspective is uh, back even a little bit further than Lee's does. Uh, I was at a conference similar to this. It was around the 1980 or 82. I don't remember exactly. Um, are you going to? Uh, okay, okay. So go ahead, change something. So, um, and in that conference, it was in Brussels, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the problem of uh, bringing nuclear power systems uh, online. And the consensus was at that time that a nuclear power system would take twice as long to develop and twice as much cost as the mission that it would support. And because of that, uh, people who were proposing missions did, were reluctant to use them to get tied into a, a, a system that that has not yet been developed and it's going to take twice as long, twice as much cost. So there weren't any users advocating for it, and technology developers weren't interested unless there was a near-term user identified. So it was what we called the CAT-22. So um, uh, after that, uh, I, at that time, I was managing the Voyager project, and, um, you know, Russia was going head-on to its flight uh, space reactors, and we were headed for... Uh, RTGs. We wound up flying over 30 RTGs in a period of time that the Russians uh, flew 30 reactors. Um, so, uh, my perspective uh, coming into into this, I, I managed the Voyager with RTGs. I managed Galileo with RTGs. I managed uh, Cassini with RTGs. I was the manager of, Put of uh, uh, um, Prometheus. Um, for the three or four years that it took us to burn through four or five hundred million dollars to get phase A done, hoping to get a start on phase B. Uh, Prometheus was passionately supported by the uh, NASA administrator, Sean O'Keefe, at the time. As a matter of fact, he came to NASA with a commitment in his own eye, in mind that uh, the only breakthrough in space exploration would be through space nuclear power. He said, we can continue the way we're going, and it's going to make incremental progress, maybe, but he says there's going to be no break breakthrough without space nuclear power. And he was the one that invented what turned out to be Prometheus. The problem was he got crossways right away with the science community, because the normal way of selecting any mission was to go through the decadal service pro uh, process. You know, Weiler, when he was running the things, he wouldn't even listen to anybody unless the mission was already identified in the decadal survey. He used it as a sure, both the sword and the shield. He would tell the Congress, look, I work for the science community, and I do what they tell me. And uh, if they don't tell me to do it, I don't do it. He used it as a sword and a shield at the same time. His sword was to say, I've got to go after this because this is what the science community wants. And if anything went wrong, he said, it wasn't my fault. You know, that's what the science community wanted. So he tried to have it both ways. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Dan Golden was an interesting guy. When he came on board, he said to the science community, you guys have hijacked the program from NASA. It's not in the NASA program, it's the science program. The S in NASA does not stand for science, it stands for space. And he, he, the law he put down at that time was, if you don't bring me a mission that has new technology in it, it's dead on my doorstep. Well, that, that was a good concept, but he never was able to follow through on that, uh, unfortunately. So then along came Prometheus, and... Uh, he, he jammed it in through the system without going through the decadal survey process at all. And the consequence of that is everyone in the science community would be angry with him. They wouldn't support him. And Fitch said him all the time, and he says, fine. So he moved it from SMD, and he put it into the human program. And then I was working for Admiral Steidel. So uh, Admiral Steidel said, I don't see where you, you're going, Kasani. This is going to cost too much. I said, I never gave you a price. What do you mean it's going to cost too much? Well, he said, I got a number, he quoted some number of three or four million dollars. I said, I never said that. The number I had was $14 billion. 
And uh, I never breathed a word of it to, to Seidel, certainly. My boss, Alachi, says, don't, do, don't tell him anything until you get through phase A. Well, <laughs> when we got through phase A, O'Keefe left. He left for 600000 not 600 kilowatts, but $600,000 to take over the operation at uh, Tulane University. It was a good move for his. He had three kids in high school who were about to go into college. He was going to need every penny of that 600 k but that, and in comes Mike Griffin, you know, and now Mike Griffin didn't want anything to do with what his predecessor has. You think uh, we changed the RTP design for it? Oh, that's like a hat. Just look at what NASA does with their administrators, you know. So and every time there's a new administrator, there's a whole change in policy, right? So uh, anyway, uh, uh, Griffin, I, I, Griffin came in and he saw $14 billion under the RTP. He swept it up, threw it in the Constellation program. Uh, we would have had Prometheus, which is So uh, we got nothing out of either one of those programs for the $14 billion. But it did not fail because it was too complicated or the mission was too ambitious. It failed because it was good for Venezuela. And that's the only threat to the state. Okay, so I, uh, this historical perspective, you can read it in the paper. It's, uh, it basically follows everything that uh, I said. Uh, basically, um, I'm saying there's an alternative. How am I doing on time -wise? Another four minutes. <laughs> okay, so I'm claiming the alternative is what um, Lee was talking about. We've already demonstrated through this uh, crusty test uh, the successful operation of this kilopower design, which came out of uh, Los Alamos and Glenn working together. Uh, really, uh, with some amazing claims. I mean, the claim is there's no uh, need to automatically or onboard control of the reactivity of the load following reactor response to whatever the power demand is. Uh, there's no need to repeat the um, uh, radiation tests with another reactor that's made to the same principles uh, in terms of the, the you know, certain dimensions and heat pipe configuration and what have you. Uh, and uh, so that that's great. It, uh, it eliminates uh, one of the problems that I had with uh, SMD a few several months ago, I went and talked to one of the guys there, and they, I, I, I would say, what's, what's your objective to this? Is it going to be so powerful in terms of the kinds of admissions that it's going to enable and, and facilitate? He says, I can't afford to own another piece of the DOE infrastructure. And what he was referring to is NASA's pouring 50 or $60 million a year into DOE to establish the infrastructure re for recreating plutonium. And that's going to, that, there's cost risk there, there's schedule risk there, uh, it's $50 million a year now, and by 2026, we're going to have the ability to produce one and a half kilograms per year. Well, uh, Cassini flew 32 kilograms of uh, plutonium. That would take 22 years to produce one and a half kilogram. And, you know, meantime, the, you're, now you're into blending because the lifetime is changing, and you've got a whole complicated series of, of uh, things that have to be managed. Uh, when, um, when I was managing Voyager and, and um, Galileo, um, people were saying, aren't you worried about the plutonium? And I said, look, if you don't love the outer planets, you cannot love plutonium. I was the biggest advocate of plutonium you could imagine. Not anymore. I'm saying if you don't love uranium, <laughs> you can't love the, you're not going to the, to the outer planets because there's not enough plutonium uh, in the pipeline to support anything but maybe a few, few very modest missions at the at the Cassini distance, and you don't need it for Jupiter. Your solar panels work well. So that's a, that's a point there. The killer reactor, I did a little description here about it. It's a joint effort between Glenn and Los Alamos. Uh, it's a, and, and they tested and fabricated a 5-kilowatt version of that. It couldn't be more than 5 kilowatt because 5 kilowatts was the limitation on the facility, not on the reactor or the design. But the, the claim is uh, that uh, with that design, uh, even though it was run at four, five kilowatts thermal, has been enough to ver validate, you know, the use of this up to 10 kilowatts without going through another radiation test. Um, that's a claim that has to be validated. And uh, our, one of our follow-on actions is going to be to establish a very high-level um, uh, uh, review by reactor specialists. Uh, I would like to get that review at the highest level possible. I don't want to say what I'm aspiring for, but I think most of you might be able to guess that. And if we get to come out of that with a clean sleeve, nobody's going to cr criticize or, or challenge us. We can 
have proof of stealing. The downside, if they say, you guys are crazy, what do you mean? You don't have to do another fission reactor test uh, in their fly. And if, that, if that's the answer, well, then we can look for something. We'll look to the next RTG to find out what we're working on. Okay, so uh, onboard activity control not uh, required. And I claim that it's got a broad use range. Um, the reactor configuration that was tested in Krusty was one kilowatt electric. And what we're shooting for is 10 kilowatts electric. With 10 kilowatts electric, we can go almost anywhere in the solar system. We can carry hundreds of kilograms of uh, science payload. We've got plenty of power to burn. We've got plenty of uh, transmission, and we go fast. We can get to Saturn, do an orbiter at, at, at uh, Neptune. We can do an, a one-year in orbit at Neptune, and then go down, spiral down to Triton, big moon, and do a one-year there. Land, and, have, and we will be in there with over 2,000 kilograms. So we got enough for a small lander to put down on on uh, on, on, on Triton, and complete that whole mission in less than 15 years. You can't even get to Saturn uh, uh, in, in less than 12 years. I'm talking about Neptune. At Saturn, we can do similar things. We can put an orbiter in at Titan and then an orbiter in Enceladus on one mission. You get there in six years and finish the whole job in 10 or 12. And, and I, it, it, this reactor is so, so simple, so lightweight, so straightforward that uh, we... Uh, we are asserting now, and we've got some more work to do, that this, this can be done, not at billions of dollars, but we're shooting for a target mission cost of one and a half billion dollars with this system. And so it makes the things a lot more affordable. At the lower end of the range, um, the one... What? Did I, have I gone over? He doesn't... I like listening to him. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, the, but I, I think there's a real threat with a plutonium... You know, I think the threat is cost uncertainty, cost risk. I think it's schedule and schedule risk. Um, and there's other higher, there's a much higher um, uh, user, competitive uh, priority user than NASA. So if things go down, like the Hyper reactor has been out for three or four months, uh, I still don't know why it went out. I don't know what the corrective action is. Uh, people that are working with the people say we, no, they, they, they say they've got it under control. Fine, that wouldn't be enough for me. I wouldn't know, want to know why that went down, what was the cause of it, what has been done to, to prevent it from happening again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They tell me, no, 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 that's DOE business, not, not mine. No, you're the customer. And we have a right to know that and a right to demand that. And that's a risk issue. So I think that it would, uh, the one kilowatt uh, the reactor could take the place in the, in the coming years. If something like that does and the bottom falls out of the two, 238, there is a way out with the the one kilowatt reactor. So I can give you a comparison with between uranium fuel and plutonium fuel. I'm not going to do that. Um, and, the, and the advantages that converter technology uh, that uh, with people were working on for the R, for the RTGs or for plutonium 238, it was really important that high conversion, the converter conversion efficiency was absolutely required. Um, but that's not a that's not a big deal with a reactor. You've got plenty of power, you know, and you. Whether it's tw not 25 percent was what they were getting at, which would have been a record breaker, we could do it with 15 or 20 percent. That's all we would need out of the converters, and the kind of low mass of the converter, which is another driver. But, uh, but given the high ISP of electric propulsion, that's not the big issue. So, and for the matter, they don't have to be qualified. So, here's some of the things they can do. I'm not going to uh, repeat them. I sort of gave you a, a pretty good indication. I think that. Uh, we're could read the report that we're working on. So here's a couple of things that I think uh, I want to call people's attention to. The question is, what can NASA do to move forward to enable future missions? And I think that they should really reevaluate their dependence on radio ISIS systems in the light of the following things. The cost and cost risk that I've talked about, the schedule risk, which I've talked about, and the management complexity. If you read the GAO report on, on this, they've identified two or three major problem areas the schedule being one, the, co the cost uncertainty be another one, and the management complexity and management over, 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 uh, oversight that would be required. And if we go to the space-based power, we can require human exploration and science mission directorates to select a common-sized core. So he knows about this. They're looking at a 10-kilowatt system for Mars surface reactor and a, even a one-and-a-half kilowatt for a, a sort of a lunar experiment. Of some kind, those same those same configurations for the 
those two uh, systems, the uh, converter technology, and the core size, and core characteristics, and what have you, should be identical. There's no reason to go off and develop two different races at the same time. Sort of agreeing with Steve in that, in that, uh, in that sense. And then, uh, so we want to find the right size Sterling engine for both, uh, and we want to develop a one 200 to 1,000 watt for backup to RTGs and continue with a 10 kilowatt for uh, for missions. So there's the conclusion. 10 kilowatt capability would enable Cassini class missions. Uh, by that, I mean with Cassini class science, through so two or 300 kilograms of science. So the solar panel and uh, RTG missions could carry one 10 kilograms of science and take you 12 years to get to uh, Saturn or something like that. You can get hundreds of kilograms and get to Saturn in, in eight years. Um, and then given uh, Krusty's success, I'm saying their timing is right now. Why, is, why fiddle around? It's, it's uh, on our doorstep and uh, it will enable compelling missions and uh, it will serve as a pathfinder for risk reduction. And uh, there's a bunch of references there. Um, I encourage you to read the paper. I apologize for talking too long fact that uh, the next speaker dedicated all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Most of his time that he may not have time to do it by then, but certainly he can do it by <laughs> Any time, yeah. <laughs> so, right. well, I, just, I like hearing John talk because, you know, he flew probably, I would say, the three most complicated nuclear-powered missions, and I should say most very complicated nuclear-powered missions that NASA's ever flown, and so he's, he's got experience here. He made them work. Uh, they far exceeded the capability. I can't remember the... Uh, you know, sometime ask him what the what the life requirement was on the RTGs on the Voyagers, and uh, and those are still running. You know, and so uh, he has a really good approach, really good perspective, and so uh, I do want to build on it now, now. Dan, can I take all of your time? Or no, no, never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. So okay, so so we won't move it on. We, 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 we won't move it all down the table, but uh, oh, okay, all right, all right. I, will, I won't take that. I'll get some back, but uh, but the uh, uh, but anyway, the uh, with NTP, you know, we are be. Yeah, we're not as advanced as, as Krusty or Kilopower. I mean, they literally built a reactor. They, they ran it. Uh, uh, extremely successful test. Hope people got to see some of the talks here this week. Uh, NTP, we're really back at the level. We're still, uh, you know, for example, developing our fuel. You know, we need a very high temperature, very uh, high uh, power density capable fuel uh, to be able to make NTP work. And so uh, we are making progress in that area. We have um, uh, fuel forms that are moving forward. We're doing a, if anyone saw the talk uh, this morning by Doug Burns, we actually have a CERMET fuel, which looks very promising. We'll be doing a test in Idaho National Lab's treat reactor uh, this coming June of that fuel form. And then we have some follow-on tests uh, coming up in uh, early 2020, and so that's that's kind of more the level. It's really just the developing the technology. We have an excellent team together working uh, very well with uh, uh, Idaho National Lab, Los Alamos National Lab, working with a lot of industry, working with the uh, other NASA centers. But it's a it's kind of a, a different uh, stage uh, of I guess of development. Uh, we uh, yeah, for example, with NTP, you mentioned the kilopower test, uh, trying to stay around five kilowatts. It's a very useful test because that's what we'll be using for a lot of these early missions. Yeah, for NTP, we could. Uh, literally have systems that are a thousand times that thermal power level. And so just the testing of those systems becomes challenging. And so uh, one of the first things you notice on NTP is it's, you know, hydrogen comes out of a propellant tank, uh, runs through the core, gets heated to very high temperature, maybe 26, 2700 degrees Kelvin, and then goes out through a nozzle. Well, that's, you know, that's the really uh, great testing done in the 60s and the 70s under the Rover Nerva program, but it's, it's a different climate now. And so one of the things we've been looking at is, okay, how do we, how do we actually test that? And we've come a uh, couple ideas of how do you fully contain that exhaust. And it basically comes down to uh, one of the options is you uh, go ahead and combust the hydrogen. So you burn the hydrogen, combine it with oxygen. Now I have water. I condense the water. Hold on to the water. If my fuel didn't behave perfectly, which it won't, um, I use, uh, you know, commercially available resins to clean up that water. And there's another uh, another processing technique that effectively is effectively you hold on to all potentially contaminated uh, propellant coming out of out of the engine. And so that's a uh, uh, so that's another technology we've been pursuing. But again, this is this is just to be able to test. They had the device assembly facility up and running and ready to test, which is great. I mean, that's what's moving us along so well. And so the uh, so that's one approach we're doing. That's that was a lot of good work done at uh, Stennis Space Center. Uh, had a lot of the major components uh, procured for that. A lot of uh, so again, a lot of a lot of forward uh, progress. Uh, but one of the things I think I wanted to 
uh, focus on, you know, just within a couple minutes, is just to get everybody thinking. Uh, in case we haven't noticed with the Krusty demonstration, uh, there is actually a lot of interest in a flight demonstration right now. Now they're actually flying a fission reactor, and it's almost like uh, I don't say maybe I don't, know, I don't say it snuck up on us, but it's just like all of a sudden. Uh, if we look around, the environment's actually pretty favorable for doing some type of a demonstration flight of a fission reactor. And so, yeah, okay, okay, yes. Hell, I'll pass the microphone back to him. He has some ideas too. <laughs> but, uh, but the uh, but the whole um, the whole point is is that's something that uh, I've actually had some great discussions here this week. I know there's a lot of brainstorming going on. It's okay. What could we reasonably pull off in a flight demonstration? Uh, to me. Uh, Part of the good news is there's actually appears to be support uh, in some circles for trying to do this by 2024, and the reason I think that's excellent news is it'll really focus everybody. You know, you know and, and that's that's good because we all you know, a lot of engineers here, and uh, oh, there's always all kinds of fun ways to try to do something. But if we really sit down and think about okay, we got till 2024 to pull this off, uh, that's going to really focus us. And so, uh, so again, a lot of great discussions, a lot of brainstorming going on. So I just want to uh, encourage people to kind of be thinking along that. Line because to me, if you know, we talk about, I, I forgot the exact title of the panel, but you know, it's basically, you know, where are we at now? That would be the vernacular for the panel, uh, you know. But uh, but that's something that's different right now. And again, I uh, uh, attribute a lot of that to the, the uh, Killer Power Krusty team for getting us to the point where people say, hey, you know, we could actually uh, try to do a flight demonstration. And uh, you know, how exactly that ends up being defined, uh, that's something we can hash out. But the key is, uh, we need to avoid the tendency. Uh, this is a joke, and this has been going. I think my first space nuclear conference was uh, maybe '88, so I was a year behind Lee. I probably saw you there, but yeah. you probably different. But uh, um, but there's this joke about how you know we always, uh, uh, whenever there's a you know some opportunity, we circle the wagons and shoot inward, and that's you know I don't want that to happen here. So there's an opportunity here, and we just need to figure out a way to uh, uh, take advantage of it. So. Uh, with that, I think I actually had maybe a minute left, and I'll go ahead and give it to Dan. He's good, good. Good. Right. good. <laughs> actually, we're now back ahead of schedule, and I, I need uh, my charts are up there, and what anticipation? I will need. Yeah, you. I trust you. I always trust you. I, I'm going to talk a little bit, little differently here. Talk about the the status of the of the program, the same one that uh, Mike was talking about, but. Uh, there's currently a, an NTP program, and then I'll take a few words at the end about where it might go. So um, go to the next chart, and there we go. This, really, this talking about the current NTP program, and this, the purpose of this program is to determine the feasibility of LEU versus HEU uh, for nuclear thermal propulsion. And the program is managed by Marshall. Mike is part of it. Uh, and it's for STMD, and it's a uh, rather complicated program in that it's got a bunch of, of industry, Aerojet Rocket 9, BWXT, AMA, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, Dash Space, they just changed their name, uh, two or three DOE labs, and three or four NASA centers, and quite a bit. And it's been going on since uh, 2016 and nominally ends uh, September of this year, except for some testing that will continue. So. What I'm going to talk about at the moment is up there now is sort of the current operational concept of where we've come to in that program. And, and then I'll talk a little bit about the vehicle and, and where it stands. But what's ha things have changed. The SLS makes for a different launch vehicle and a different launch environment, which is helping everyone who looks at uh, exploring transportation for uh, going to Mars. And um, what you do now but you didn't do in the past. You used to launch to LEO. Now you launch, ideally, to a, to a, a high LD heel, high uh, Earth orbit, and then you go over to the gateway orbit, you aggregate up in the gateway orbit, and uh, test things out a bit, and you stay there quite a while, so that brings in such questions as cryofluid management. But then ultimately, when you're ready to go, up comes the Orion. Actually, you come down to LD heel. Then the Ryan comes up and joins you, and then you go off to Mars. And this sounds good. Uh, you spend your time there. You come back, back into LD Heo. The crew comes back to Earth, and you go back, ideally, to uh, uh, the Gateway orbit. Ideally, even though the program will not yet say reusable, I would say you're probably reusable, so you'll go back there to be refueled. 
So next chart. This is the sort of where we've come in terms of a vehicle and an engine. And a couple of interesting choices were made by the uh, Marshall Program Office and us, but primarily by the Lockheed Program Manager, uh, Sonny Mitchell. We could normally on any kind of thing like this, particularly the chemicals do this, you look at what's my payload, and then you do whatever's necessary to get there on the least, uh, lowest energy orbit, because otherwise you get big, 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 big. We could do that, and all we'd be is a little bit lighter in the vehicle, and so who cares? So what was chosen was actually to go, instead of with two, uh, we have there, the, the bottom of it is a stage with engines on it, uh, there are 25K engines, there's three of them, and then all the next three stages are just fuel. We could have had two. We baseline three. That way, what we got out of it is a very robust system that could handle uncertainties. That was the heart and soul of, of what, we, what he chose to do. <coughs> and the system, and we can do all of this without prepositioning propellant, and so we had relatively uh, benign con ops, uh, and, and a system that allows us robustness. Now, I, I know, all of you here, without a doubt, know this, that no government program, the payload would ever grow over time. But if it did, this gives us quite a bit of capability. It does such things as giving us from 20 to 45% increase in payload, and we wouldn't have to change anything here, but we'd go slower, because we're not yet using the lowest uh, uh, energy orbit. Next chart, please. This is basically shown here. This is looking at a chemical, and they go slower. What it really means is they are going on the, the low energy orbit, and I'm cheating because I can afford to cheat. I can go on the higher, uh, higher energy orbits, and, and that means instead, if anything goes wrong, I can drop back and fly on his orbits. I can fly on the lower energy orbits. So we've built in robustness. What, what the thing has given us which is not available to a chemical system, is, is robustness. I can abort three months into the system. They can't do things like that. I can see payload growth without having to change my system. Uh, with another stage and doing some of the things that they might do like staging, I can at least address uh, opposition, uh, opposition class instead of just conjunction class orbits. So that's what we buy. So this thing basically gives you a robust ability to address uh, going to Mars, and no one else really does that for you. Now, the question is the next chart. I haven't heard this from anybody here, but I believe most of us have heard the pivot to the moon. It's occurred to someone, uh, and potentially that might mean that Mars moves a little bit to, uh, to the right. <laughs> yes, indeed, it may move a lot to the right. So, does that kill us? What's it going to do? That's the question we ought to be asking ourselves. And as both Sonny Mitchell uh, has said, the program off, uh, manager at Marshall, and my boss, who used to, Jim Mazur, who used to run Rocket 9 and now runs uh, the space division for Aerojet Rocket 9, we have to find something else we can do. We, uh, you've got to show that there's some other applicability to nuclear thermal propulsion or things are going to get slow. Once more, we will go and become like many other things that have been talked about here. So I'm going to show charts on two of them and mention a third. So the next chart. One, obviously, is lunar. If you're going to pivot to the moon, it would be nice to be able to show that there is, there is applicability to uh, nuclear thermal propulsion in the, in the cislunar environment. This chart was shown by Russ earlier today, earlier yesterday, or right today, I think. But anyway, it's shown. It's in his paper. And later this year, we'll do some more papers where we explore the full use of nuclear thermal in many of the different ways that you can use it in cislunar space. This one happens to be a rescue uh, situation where you can get people back more, more, much more quickly from the moon. But obviously, you could use it as a tug from LEO to either the Gateway or LLO or take it all the way down. I don't really see why you can't land in the moon nuclear. But we'll explore that and some more. The second chart is going back to what was just mentioned a little bit ago, and this is also shown by Russ earlier, but we can take, this is a lovely, lovely thing to go to the, for deep space. 
I can give you a lot of payload or I can get you there very quickly. Also, because of the way we have designed this, we have a, a very low flow regime, which we call a, an ohm system where we want to do small delta V, so we use only a small amount of propellant uh, and use it just through some of the tie tubes. That means we're pre-plumbed for, we're, we're not a bimodal system, but we, we pre-plumbed to give you an order of one or two kilo, kilowatts of power with a little bit. It's like the old days when you bought a car and they gave you options, would you pay a little more money? We're basically pre-plumbed and you could do that. So, so you, you could also have power. Uh, not from the point of view that's fairly high power for the scientists, pretty low power for us, our point of view. But so that's one. The last chart is uh, showing the same thing, but for a much, much higher energy uh, orbit. In this case, showing a, a flyby, basically. <coughs> if you're going to orbit, you're going to have to take that out of your payload. So, and the last part of it is we don't have charts, but We've also looked at other applications that might be more interest to other customers, such as DOD, which has much more money and would tend to be a bit more flexible. Um, in fact, it is Mike who has been funding that part of the study, uh, which we call versatile energy. So I think we need to, to think about that and care about that. And so I, I, I wish you all to think about it, because NTP offers a lot. But with the pivot to the moon, it could, the technology could become very un, unfunded or low funded. And it shouldn't have to be because it has applications both for deep space and cislunar. And with that, I'll give it to the person who's going to sum us up very well. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. As Wes said, my name is Pavia Lal. I work at the IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute, or STIPI. Uh, at STIPI, we support the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, NASA, FAA, uh, DOD, ODNI, and other government agencies um, on a variety of uh, uh, analytical subjects in science and technology. For the last many years, we've been working on several projects where we have focused on identifying challenges in the nation's space nuclear enterprise, not just the technology end, but also the policy and legal regulatory end, as well as uh, looking forward, ways forward. Um, as part of that, we've reached out to many of you, and thank you so much for all the help you've given us over the years. Um, I may have my first two uh, degrees in nuclear engineering, but my comments today will focus on my second two degrees, which are in science and technology policy. So my comments are going to be focused on the policy aspects of space nuclear power. Um, and I have three major points to make. The first one is that, in my view, the biggest challenge of the nuclear enterprise is in technology. As you've heard the last many days, there's plenty of technology under development. I think where we have repeatedly failed <coughs> and fallen down is on the why of, of, of space nuclear. If we want the nuclear enterprise to flourish, we cannot lead with a solution. For example, saying, let's make nuclear power a national priority. Now, don't get me wrong, we do need that. We do need uh, space nuclear power to be a national priority, but that needs to be preceded by a narrative. Why should it be a national priority? If we are going to divert funds to nuclear power, and diverting is the correct word, the federal budget pie isn't going to get a whole lot bigger, why would we do that? What do we get that we don't get by doing something else? So on that why, there may not be a single one that works for all stakeholders. Uh, earlier in the week, you heard General Quast, the peacemaker, on, on Monday effectively um, articulating one why that is popular in some circles, you know, that we cannot let our adversaries gain the high ground, and we need absolute supremacy in space over other countries. If that argument gets traction with Congress and funding agencies, that's great. Personally, I find the why Jack Marburger, a former presidential advisor, articulate um, uh, what he said about, the, the, about bringing the solar system in our economic realm more stirring. That vision has aspects of both commerce and spreading out in the solar system. Regardless of which why, and we may actually need many why since we do have a range of uh, stakeholders, it is up to us to develop and present the narrative for the need for space nuclear power, especially to those who hold the purse strings. Once we are able to present this compelling narrative, we are now ready for the what, you know, whether it relates to missions on the, uh, to, on the moon or Mars, missions for the DOD or other commercial missions. And you know, we heard about a whole uh, set of missions uh, from the speakers before. 
My second point is, <coughs> uh, once we have the what, the what has to follow a clear plan, funding, and timelines. And on these items, I had five thoughts. When we develop the plan, it shouldn't just be for technology development. I think as, 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 as engineers, we tend to jump too quickly into the details. We need to ensure that policies move alongside, for example, policies related to launch safety or contingency planning in the event of a mishap in space. At the same time, um, make sure that the legal and regulatory framework moves forward as well, including international treaties, treaty obligations related to on-orbit authority, for example. Um, also, this is something that at least I have to keep reminding myself that in this plan, we shouldn't forget that nuclear isn't the end goal and shouldn't, um, for example, so, so a tech demo, for example, couldn't be a, 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 <coughs> a goal point. It's a waypoint. We need to remember that nuclear power is an enabling technology and part of a suite of tools to achieving a big picture goal, which means a whole bunch of other things need to develop as we move take nuclear power forward. A third piece is the flexibility. Any nuclear development program will last through multiple administrations and congresses, and I think uh, uh, Lee had mentioned that. Um, and, and whatever the strategic plan is, it needs to be flexible and allow for branching and course correction. Um, Multi-generational cathedral building is actually now increasingly difficult given how fast technology is progressing, how politically polarized we are, and, and in any case, how things are, are just moving so fast that um, having long-term plans may just lock us into outdated technologies. A fourth piece, is, and again that came, <coughs> came up before, is that cost is a major factor from a policy perspective. In recent years, we've learned a lot about alternative means of contracting and working with industry. An example is a NASA COTS program, which allowed NASA to share uh, financial risk with, uh, with private agencies, which can be a model. The government has also used other mechanisms like advanced purchase commitments and service contracts like the NASA CRS contract. Um, so for example, one option might be for NASA to offer to buy power at a certain price at a certain place in space, and, and that drives innovation. Which brings me to the point of commercial uh, developments. And this is something that has been going on in the space sectors for the last 15, 20 years, probably longer, but in the space nuclear sector, we have seen it in the last few years with the emergence of startups like Atomos, Ultrasafe, NewScale, and others. And these are companies that are bringing new life into the space community, and the government needs to leverage this energy and innovation. Um, we need to listen to commercial entities and question some sacred cows. You know, what needs to be ground tested? What can be tested in space? And uh, this is something we've heard a lot in, our, in, our, in, a, in a recent report that we are writing on, on, on um, launch approval process for commercial space that in encouraging the, the private sector requires clear guidelines and cost-effective regulations to ensure that we don't kill burgeoning innovation. My third major point is, and I think <coughs> and this, is, this has been brought up before, we need to learn lessons from the past, uh, whether it's SB100 program or the Prometheus program, and, and what would we want to do differently this time? There's people in this room on this, uh, on this podium who can answer this question, and we need to make sure we ask them and we listen to them. Um, I think one lesson as I see it is to ensure continuity and progress, we need to set nearer-term goals and show early wins. A 10 to 20-year program will lose momentum quickly. A big program is also a target practice for, for cancellations. Um, within the lesson learned, I think one final lesson I want to talk about is our love for jointness. We always want to seem to want that silver bullet that solves all the needs of all the people. You know, how can we bring together DOD and NASA and NRO and everybody else to, to come up with one solution, you know, one for power, for propulsion, and it's just something that hasn't worked out in the past. And I think we need to really carefully look at that. We've had the experience of the shuttle where we tried to kind of merge multiple requirements. Um, you know, uh, earlier we talked about the MMRTG as well. While I wouldn't say we let the past hamstring us or that we shouldn't consider joint projects, we just need to tread carefully and learn lessons. To end my time, I would like to reiterate three of my major points. The first is have a compelling narrative, a why before developing a what for the space program uh, or the, for, for space nuclear power. Second is develop a plan with timelines, budgets, and milestones till the end point, making sure that it's not all about technology but incorporates legal uh, policy and regulatory developments as well. 
The plan should be flexible with near-term wins and leveraging commercial developments. Third, cost is a factor and the government should attempt to streamline by using some newly developed contracting instruments that cut out bureaucracy. And last but not least, uh, learn lessons from past efforts, especially those related to joint programs, uh, but without letting hamstring that hamstring uh, our future. Um, I believe we are at an inflection point for a complex set of reasons, and actually that's an area where Stippy has done some work recently. Um, there is tremendous synergy and excitement to move a step function up. Let all of us in the room do our best to make it happen. As my daughter used to say when she was in elementary school, turn it up, game on. So let's thank our speakers for today. We, we do have four minutes for questions. Is our panel comfortable taking Q&A? Yes? All right. Do we have any questions? Thanks. So I just won't go away. So, you know, I, f I find it interesting, it's sort of an, sort of an observation uh, and, then, and then a follow-up question. And, you know, I find it interesting that we heard a lot of the presentations on the technology and, and uh, John spoke very uh, eloquently about the need for fish and power and none of you guys talked, talked really about the cost. And then Bobby finished it up and talked just about exclusively about the cost. And, you know, I kind of see this from, from where I've been is, is this is sort of the key problem, that there is this, this, this huge gap between trying to figure out how, this, how to make something fit and then dealing with the costing realities because, because they're certainly out there. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I know Lee and, and leading up the, 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 the kilopower effort, I mean, the idea has been tried and trying to keep the cost down in order to by keeping it simple, but you know we're still not there, and I'm I'm just wondering if any of you would like to like to perhaps comment on this observation of mine that we're not going to get there until we somehow figure out how to put the cost together with uh, with something that we can really build and fly. Oh, so uh, Ralph, I guess the only real data point we have with respect to cost and doing a nuclear reactor is crusty. In less than four years and less than $20 million total government investment, we designed, built, and tested a reactor. Now, clearly that's not the reactor we're gonna fly in space, but I think it represents a model of what we could do in developing a space system. In other words, a lot of the space reactors that had been contemplated in the past were hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions. But those were based on ground test programs that were probably hundreds of millions of dollars. So if you can somehow translate the $20 million crusty test and, and use that proportionally to develop a flight system, I think we're in the game. And I, so I think there is a possibility of developing an affordable <coughs> space reactor if you can follow a template that was established with crusty. Let's thank our speakers. Thanks for getting my alarm. <laughs> that was funny. I was like, oh no, I'm so far away. <laughs>